Good afternoon, morning, evening, as the case may be. Welcome to History of Economic Thought, Hillsdale College. Here we go. Um, let's see, what will we do today? Well, we'll start out by asking announcements. Any Praxis events scheduled yet? Nothing? CLO? No? All right, get to work. Um, let's see, what are we going to do today? Uh, today we're going to return to uh, our, our, we're going to finish up the discussion of the marginal revolution and uh, the development of the ideas. And so we're going to face, or we're going to feature the third root or the third leg of this, of this revolution. And that's the School of Lausanne. Now, the School of Lausanne is quite important, but before we tackle this, I want to do something. It's a little bit strange, but we're going to go back to Marshall's partial equilibrium approach. Because Walras says, this is all wrong. What Marshall has done is wrong. He has missed the most important features of the economy. But to explain this, I have to, I have to do something that's a little bit different. If we were all in the same room, I would have this, this is what I'd have you do, and I don't think I should change now. I'm going to require everyone to take an oath. You raise your hand. You do this. Get your hand up. Come on. And I'm going to ask you to repeat the following. I, and you say your name, I do solemnly swear, affirm, vow, promise, etc. to never do, what Professor Steele is about to do on the blackboard, or whiteboard, uh, that I will never do this on an exam, homework, or anything else. So help me, Mises. All right, what I'm going to do is something that is a, a, an abuse of Marshall's approach. And it's totally wrong. And yet, it makes total sense. And this is the criticism that comes from Walras. So let's look at this. We'll try a green marker for this. I should use red because this is an abuse. Let's do that. Great. All right. Imagine that there are two consumer goods, X and Y. There is sub substitutes or complements. Doesn't matter. Uh, we'll just pick one. We'll think of them as being how about substitutes. So here's the market for good X. Let me get a better marker than that that shows up. Market for good X. Price of X, quantity of X, and we'll go here, quantity of Y, and price of Y. There's the market for good Y, and we'll go demand for X, supply of X, demand for Y, supply of Y, and we know where the equilibrium is. It's there, and now we just call it. Q prime and P prime, and uh, over here, Q prime and P prime, whatever those happen to be, and they are substitutes for each other. That's how consumers treat them. Great. OK, so what happens? One day, there's some, some sort of a change just for, for whatever reason, an exogenous change. Demand goes up. People's preferences changed for good X. Great, so what happens? Well, there you go. Demand shifts up. Um, probably shouldn't have called it. Well, we say it's to um, D double prime. Great, so what happens? Well, the price of X goes up. Everyone knows that. Great, and end of story. That's just great, and end of story. Wait, is that the end of the story? It's a substitute. The price just went up. So what happens over here for good Y? Oh, well, that means that the demand for Y goes up. Great. Demand for Y goes up to D double prime uh, because there was the in price increase here. Uh, and that means that the price of Y goes up. OK, great. Good. Now we are done. Um, well, wait a minute. The price of Y just went up. And it's a substitute for, oh, well, in that case, Price of a substitute, went, oh, this demand has to shift, shift up even more to D triple prime. That drives the price of this one up. But that means that the price over here, the demand must be going up to D triple prime. That's three, et cetera. Price must be, oh, wait. OK. That's wrong. That's not the way to utilize these models. 
but you all know that that's true. What I've just told you makes total sense. And this is Leon Walras' criticism of Marshall's ceteris paribus approach. You can't hold those things constant because that's not the way the economy works. Walras' argument is that Marshall has missed the interconnectedness of markets. And that's got to be a fundamental feature of our theory. And so he develops what is called general equilibrium theory. And that's the hallmark of the school of Lausanne. Um, great. So let's tell the story of Leon Walras. And this is a little bit more dense than some of the other material we've gone through. And I'm going to cut out some of the mathematics, I think, that I sometimes present, but may send that to you in a set of notes. So let's erase and begin with the story of Walras. <clears throat> and uh, grab the uh, this marker. Oh, that's a nice bright one. So. Leon Walras, and he lived from 1834 to 1910. He's Frenchman. But he worked at the school of Lausanne in Switzerland. He was actually not very highly regarded in France, interestingly enough. He stayed at Lausanne. He started there in 1870. He was a professor there until 1892. He was not given very much regard in France. He was better known in Britain and Austria. Um, he was initially, he began as a, interested in art. As, as we know, his father, Antoine Walras, was a classmate of Corneau. And, and Antoine Walras had his son read Corneau and said, this is an important person. You should know about his material. But his son decided to become an artist, and he was initially studying art. But at some point, he saw the light. And in 1858, he changed and decided to become an economist. And he already was introduced to these ideas uh, of uh, demand. So it's arguable, according to uh, Haney's book, that there really was no Walrasian school, that well, he was just another thing. but. But I think really we have to think that there, there is a sort of a school here. In 1892, when he steps down, he is replaced by Vilfredo Pareto. And we'll talk about Pareto in a separate lecture. Uh, but Pareto is also an extremely important economist, an Italian who uh, said that he would, he was from the Italian nobility he, or aristocracy, and said that he would uh, continue uh, his work. That was why he was chosen. Other members of the school, it's a very loose school in the early days, would include the Italian Enrico Barone and Newt Wicksell, who's also influenced by the Austrians. And uh, in addition, the Cassell. Cassell's first name is Gustav. Um, both of these gentlemen are Swedish. There's actually the beginnings of a Swedish school of economics. And it tends to be inspired by the Walrasians and by the Austrians, interestingly enough. Um, much later, we have people such as John R. Hicks as being important members of this school, in a sense. Um, Paul Samuelson. Paul Samuelson. Kenneth Arrow. and Gerard de Brew. These three being Americans, and he is from Britain. I put these names up. Every one of them is a Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, this becomes central stuff to economics. They're awarded, these are all 20th century economists, get their Nobel Prizes in part for their work in general equilibrium theory. Uh, this is considered very important for technical economists. Now, Walras himself was very slow to gain fame. Uh, he was very slow to have his theory catch on for a couple of reasons. First of all, he was a difficult person. He corresponded with Jevons and got along pretty well with him, corresponded with a lot of people. Uh, but with the other Brits, he just got into big arguments. They didn't like him, and he didn't like them. He did get on with Jevons. Um, he was pretty anti-English. 
and they were anti-Walras. But there's another point, and this is something that he said. The way he put it, if one wants to harvest quickly, one must plant carrots and salads. If one plants oaks, one must be content with the shade enjoyed by grandchildren. Great. Uh, Marshall is uh, making bunny food. I am planting a forest that will be great someday. But this is hard stuff, and it has to develop. <clears throat> That's his idea. Well, his objective, like that of Carl Menger, is truth. He wants to talk about the connections in the economy. Marshall is simply trying to, with his partial equilibrium approach, develop something that's useful. But he wants truth. Great. Well, in, uh, so we'll proceed from there. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So when Walras began, what I want to talk about is the ideas from Walras. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about his... Um, um, his approach to mathematics, his, uh, then uh, his approach to marginal utility theory. Those will be brief, but then we will tackle general equilibrium theory and equilibration. And I've got to put more, we'll put more time into that. So, let's begin. The uh, 1874 is when he fires his first shot in the marginal revolution. And that's with his, uh, econo his uh, elements of pure political economy. I've got it in French. Elements d'économie politique pure. Uh, but we'll write it in English. Elements of pure political Economy. Great. Um, so he develops his ideas on mathematics, marginal, marginal utility theory, general equilibrium theory, and equilibration. And so with respect to mathematics, he says economics has to be mathematical. And he re represents the economy as a series of equations. He says economics is about utility, but it's about prices and quantities, and therefore math is the proper way to treat it. The economy for him is a series of equations, as we will see. He was not mathematically very good. He was not very deep. And so his methods were not always right. Plus, general equilibrium is a tremendously complex mathematical problem. It, we don't get it, not until we're well into the 20th century, can people even figure out how to treat this mathematically, as we will see. Um, so that's enough about math. Um, let's move on to his marginal utility theory, because he believed that his single most important achievement was showing how demand curves came from subjective utility. It's very similar to what Jevons has done, very similar to what Menger has done, so we won't go into that carefully, but he called it rarité, and for him, marginal utility or rarité is the intensity of the last want satisfied. It is subjective marginal utility, and that's what generates the demand curve. That's underlying everything. So like Menger and like Jevons, he doesn't believe this objective cost stuff that Marshall has talked about, but rather he promotes the whole idea of a subjective marginal utility explanation for prices. Um, but he also says that demand for a good act, for a particular good is, for any particular good, the demand is a function of all prices in the market. This is the way he is going to link his whole economy, his whole model of the economy uh, through mathematics. The demand for any good is a function of all the prices for all the goods. Oh, it does make a kind of sense because it's not just, I see the price, I'm going to buy a hamburger. I have to look at the price of hamburger, but I look at the price of hot dogs. I look at the price of hamburger buns, hot dog buns, uh, ketchup uh, should be influenced by the price of beer. If I have beer, whatever, um, uh, 
ammunition. If I'm thinking I could spend my money on food, but I could buy ammo after all, <laughs> it's a crisis, uh, or toilet paper, or save it for automobiles, or the price of everything ought to go into that demand function. Because every time we spend a dollar, think of all the other things we, we think of all the other things we could have spent it on. So the prices of everything ought to be in the demand function. That's his argument. And he then goes ahead and derives the usual marginal conditions to get equilibrium in a market. But he wants general equilibrium, that is equilibrium in all markets at the same time. Great. That's Marshall, or sorry, that's Walras on, uh, on equilibrium, or sorry, on, on, uh, on utility. So let's then proceed to general equilibrium. And <laughs> this is, I guess the question is, how much math do you want? Because we could put an awful lot down here. Uh, but we're going to start out with his general equilibrium theory and explain it at least what the, what the notion of it is. Uh, general equilibrium, and that's going to be abbreviated GE. It's a model of all markets, that is, of the entire economy. Good. Now, this is his most famous achievement. If you say general equilibrium to, let's say, uh, a modern Austrian economist, oftentimes you'll hear people snarl and gnash their teeth and say, oh my gosh, all this is too mathematical. Now, in some ways that might be a mistake because it isn't that the general equilibrium modeling is the problem, it's rather the use or abuse of it. Ludwig von Mises, the great Austrian economist, has uh, a model that he calls the evenly rotating economy. That's an Austrian version of general equilibrium. And it's very, ex Mises is explicit, and he calls that an indispensable tool. The problem is treating general equilibrium as if it is all of economics and there's nothing else to say. And of course, Austrians, Mises, want to talk about, well, what if you're not in equilibrium? Because the real world, there's no way to say that it is, and it almost certainly isn't in equilibrium, a general equilibrium. So how do you address that? The Chicago School, Milton Friedman, has tended to have a, a different response to this. And uh, Milton Friedman said, look, this is just unwieldy and it's not very useful as a tool of analysis. We like the, uh, Friedman likes the, the Marshallian partial equilibrium better. So it depends on your purpose and what you're trying to do. The modern general equilibrium approach is pure mathematics, pretty much. It also, it's important for you to know something about it because it underlies almost 100% of modern macroeconomics and much of modern microeconomics. So we're going to proceed with it. Um, it's also, I should, just as an aside, how did, how did Walras conceive of it? One of his biographers, uh, William Jaffe, um, says that Walras, he doesn't believe Walras meant it to be a true description of the market economy, but rather as a, what he called, realistic utopia, or sort of an idea towards which we should, an ideal towards which we should strive. So maybe a target, maybe in some ways a little bit like what Austrians think that entrepreneurship does. But here's what we mean by general equilibrium. This is the setup, and this is a little complicated. I've got to write it down. So first of all, we assume the following things must hold, and that's utility maximization for every, everyone, every person in the economy. And so we've got for every good, we'll say that's person I, and we've got many different things, and there's the price, there's the, sorry, for good, um, we'll just call it good X, and the price of, <laughs> oh heavens, and the price of x is equal to the marginal utility for person i over and marginal utility for good z for person i over the price of z, etc. And we can have as many goods in the economy as we wish. 
Okay, great. In fact, we're going to say that there are n products, where n is just some very big number. I think that the Soviets, I don't know what it is, uh, the Soviets said that they had, they thought they had 15 million different products in their economy. So it's a big number. Well, utility maximization means that everybody adjusts their purchases so that this equilibrium condition holds, so that that's true. Great, well, what's the next thing? The next thing is firms maximize profit. Okay, all firms are doing that. And so what are they doing? They're buying factors of production, inputs, and they are producing then and selling these, out, these N outputs. So we've got M factor, well, we'll put this down as, as, as a different point, I guess. Um, but firms are all maximizing profit. They buy factors by, oh heavens, come on. Don't let the English professors see me doing that. By product, by factors of production, and sell their output, their products, their output. Great. N of those and M of those. What else do we have? Um, for any market, or we could say for every market, um, the market demand is the sum of the individual demands. Some of the individual demands. And the market supply is, not surprisingly, the sum of the individual firm supplies or the individual supplies of labor. Uh, if we're thinking of factors. And what that gives us is that all of these individuals comprise the, uh, the markets. Uh, his fourth part of his model is that we now know there will be N output markets and M factor markets. And that means a total of N plus M markets in total. Great. He also assumes that in each market there will be just one price. I'm going to move over here. So one price in each market. So we don't have, for example, price discrimination or people uncertain and paying different prices for goods. Um, we have one particular price. And the incomes um, in the factor markets Uh, these generate the consumer incomes that are used in the, in the individual utility maximization. That's where these things are coming from. So I'll draw an arrow to show that that's that link. And great, we've got it. That's all the stuff. So what's general equilibrium? The price in Every market is such that quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. That is, the X marks the spot in Marshall's term. Um, great, quantity demanded, quantity supplied, so that one price in each market clears the market exactly, and all of that maximization is occurring. Those are the, that's the setup. Now, here's the question. Why should all this stuff fit together and generate that at all? And the question becomes, is equilibrium in the factor markets consistent with equilibrium in the product markets? Um, that's not, not obvious. Are individual utility maximization and firm profits, are those compatible with any of this? 
Does maximization actually lead to this? And there are three questions formally that come up here. And those three questions are, first of all, existence. Does a general equilibrium even exist? Is it possible to have market clearing in all markets at the same time? So the first question is um, existence. Does a general equilibrium exist even in, even just conceptually? Is it possible? And also, can there be a mechanism that will guarantee or that will get us to that? That's question number one. Question number two is uniqueness. If there is an equilibrium, is there more than one? Are there different combinations of prices that would take us to a general equilibrium? Um, are there multiple equilibria, is that question. Now that seems obscure, except it raises the question of, if there are multiple equilibria, could there be such a thing as a good equilibrium and a bad equilibrium? That's actually pretty important. If, for example, you are an Austrian economist and you say entrepreneurship equilibrates, hmm, does it matter? Could you be going towards a good equilibrium or a bad equilibrium? Is there a distinction there? There's a paper that came out probably about 1990 by a couple of economists, Zariadis and Drazen, who argued that one reason third world countries don't develop is they get stuck on a bad equilibrium. Uh, interesting argument that they make, and so this is an issue. Uh, there's a third question that arises, and that's the question of stability. Um, if something happens to disrupt the equilibrium, will the economy return to it? I used to use uh, Katrina as my example, but here's a different example. We just shut down the economy, much of it, in the United States. Uh, so that disrupted the equilibrium, if we were even close to one. And the question is, what do we return to? Will we go back to the same equilibrium, a different one, or, or what will happen? Okay. That's an important question. Uh, what about if we think about the Schumpeterian uh, entrepreneur who disrupts the equilibrium uh, with his innovation, uh, Joseph Schumpeter's idea, um, does that lead to instability? Or does, do we return to equilibrium? Now here's the relevance again. Mises, Kirzner, people like this say that entrepreneurship takes us toward, toward equilibrium. We don't reach it because things are changing, but they say this is, this is what entrepreneurship does. Chicago School says when we talk about why the, uh, why the market system is good, we rely on the prop properties of general equilibrium, a competitive equilibrium, is how Chicago argues for benefits of the market. Um, Ludwig Lachmann, another, on, another Austrian, says that entrepreneurship actually does not take us towards equilibrium, and equilibrium is probably meaningless. So these are actually important questions for people outside of the uh, Walrasian school, and so we're going to continue and tackle those things.